welcome everyone. So uh, happy to be talking to you today about one of um, kind of my favorite things to think about these days, and that is, you know, how uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are uh, affecting our lives and um, affecting the kind of work that we need to be prepared to do in uh, the future, and particularly our role in higher education in kind of helping you all create uh, that future. So let's get started. All right. So is it a revolution or an evolution? Um, I will let you decide. Uh, however, um, it's important, regardless of, of where you stand on the issue, uh, to, to do a little self-evaluation and, and try to understand if you're ready. Because um, from my perspective, uh, you know, the uh, train has left the station and things are moving fast in the world. And AI and machine learning will be, and in many cases already are, uh, being used across nearly every single sector uh, of the economy. So let's dive right in. All right. So when I was in high school back in the Stone Ages, um, I was part of the very last class that ever learned to type on an actual typewriter. So a lot has changed in the 30 years since then. For instance, I don't use a typewriter anymore. Uh, and all of my kids are actually learning to type in third grade at the moment. And uh, if I'm being honest, these days, ChatGPT does most of the typing for me. In fact, uh, OpenAI's DALI application created all of the images for this uh, presentation. So if you haven't had a chance to go play with some of these generative AI uh, technologies, do yourself a favor, get out there and get familiar with what's going on uh, because the world continues to change and uh, productive coexistence with technology is not guaranteed. Our companies in our jobs, uh, they're going to depend on thoughtful use of this new class of tools within uh, our organizations, businesses, government, etc. Okay, so here's the plan. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where this kind of notion of AI came from. To talk a bit more about what an AI-assisted future looks like. So what does work look like uh, with AI, machine learning, helping us out? Uh, and then what responsibility do we have and, and what is our school, the School of Computing Information Sciences, doing to help make sure that folks are ready for uh, this future? So let's start with a very brief history of AI. And I, I'm saying that this is very brief because we could spend... Uh, an entire semester going through uh, everything that has led up to where we are now. And so I'm not going to go back that far. I'm going to start in roughly the 1990s. And believe it or not, I wrote my very first AI app uh, in 1999 for an elective course on machine learning using the Perl programming language. If, um, if you remember what that language is, or you still use it, uh, then you are just as old as I am. Um, so this technology certainly isn't new, but its use and usefulness has been steadily increasing over the past 30 years. So the 1990s were largely characterized by expert systems and rule-based AI, basically embedding expert knowledge into systems with predefined rules based on what we already knew. So for instance, you might know from marketing research that a credit card customer who hasn't made a purchase in a while is more likely to cancel their card. And the system could prompt a customer service representative to take action based on this rule. So you've got some sort of expert knowledge about a context embedded into a computing system uh, and then used in some organizational context. During the 2000s, we saw a, a real substantial rise in machine learning algorithms applied to business problems. So rather than rely on some heuristic, right, some expert knowledge that we acquired in some other way, we actually used 
uh, these machine learning algorithms to figure out things about our organizations. So we taught the machine learning models uh, how to figure out exactly who that credit card customer is uh, who's going to cancel their card and, and how likely they are. And so it's not just some sort of rule-based AI, but we're actually running the algorithms to learn the rules to begin with. Skip ahead to the 2010s. Uh, these are characterized by uh, Kaggle competitions, Kaggle being uh, kind of a, a giant uh, data science clearinghouse. They, they have competitions for analysis uh, um, that really, really uh, kind of spurred the industry forward. And uh, in particular, the use of deep learning. And, and deep learning is different uh, from uh, kind of more traditional statistical learning in that it's based on kind of an algorithmic model of uh, the human brain. And so we we say things like neural networks. And when people say neural networks, that uh, typically refers to uh, the use of deep learning as opposed to uh, other algorithms like a decision tree or a regression model. Um, where uh, the learning is uh, constructed using a slightly different uh, type of algorithm. And these large deep learning models were very good at doing things like image recognition. And so we could tell you know, if a video had a cat in it uh, or a dog. And, and uh, this was actually a, a major breakthrough uh, for the technology. So that brings us to the current day. Uh, and our current decade, though it's not over, um, is likely to be defined by AI ethics and generative AI. Um, so you think about uh, AI ethics, if you're following the news, um, the European Union just passed a large bit of legislation uh, regulating the use and development of AI in uh, European Union countries. And uh, of course, generative AI has been in the news and on everyone's tongues for uh, quite some time now. Um, and many of you may actually be using it uh, in uh, your studies or at work. And so when uh, I think of this evolution in a general sense, I tend to define each decade uh, in the, the following way oh. before I get there. Fun fact. So 20 years before ChatGPT, there was a chatbot called Smarter Child. It was accessed via AOL Instant Messenger. If you know about AOL Instant Messenger, congratulations. That was kind of the original a uh, messaging system back in the early days of the internet. Uh, I remember it fondly. All right, <laughs> so <laughs> on to the broader point. When I think about each decade, right, in the evolution of machine learning, at least over the last 35 years or so, I think of it this way. I think of the growth of our capacity, largely driven by increases in the amount of data that we have and the amount of power, that we can apply uh, to that data as this process of actually fairly traditional learning. It mirrors in many ways the way that humans themselves uh, mature and learn over time. We start our lives by following some examples, you know, of maybe our parents or our peer group. We then have enough experience that we can generalize across uh, these examples uh, and learn some patterns, right? So the next step is that we we actually uh, kind of have an internal algorithm and we learn patterns that allow us to interact in the world. We learn enough of these patterns and then we can start to predict the future a little bit. Like, you know, how's mom gonna react when I ask her for, you know, some gas money, uh, you know, to go to the movies or something like that, right? So we, we develop, not just, we haven't just learned who mom is, we can now predict how mom is going to respond when we ask for things. And then uh, we get to this last stage where, you know, given enough predictions or enough capacity to predict, um, we can actually then combine these to generate a novelty, something new, something different than what already exists in the world. And that's the place that we currently sit uh, in the world of artificial intelligence. We now have large language models, image generation software, et cetera, that is generating 
um, kind of novel creations from, you know, in excess of, of predictive capacity. So how are these stages actually being enacted in industry? I picked three different kind of areas uh, which are near and dear to, to kind of the, the core of, of Oregon's, you know, industrial power. So if you think about Oregon, we, we have a lot of forestry and agriculture. We do a lot of energy, uh, energy storage. And then uh, we're also known for retail and apparel. So these are big industries within Oregon. Uh, all of them are using machine learning and AI at some different level of maturity. And so it's useful to think in, in, in the way that these uh, different sectors are actually applying AI and at what level. So if you look at forestry and agriculture, at the basic level, right, at the following level, they may follow a set of predetermined rules to notify farmers of water use. You could use a machine learning application to learn how, you know, various inputs uh, actually yield the best crops. You could then kind of take what you learn to actually predict things like how much water Southern Oregon will have next year. You may notice uh, in the not too distant future that many of our uh, weather predictions are going to get uh, a bit more accurate because a large deep learning model is starting to outperform some of the more physics-based uh, models of weather. Um, and last, you know, generate something, perhaps a plan for regional water usage that, mod uh, that maximizes crop yield. And so there's room in this large kind of industrial area uh, to use AI and machine learning at almost any level of, of maturity. Uh, and in fact, most organizations out there are still at levels one and two in, in their implementation. And so there's tons of room for those of us who know how to do it uh, to get in there and actually help people do better. Similar example in energy and storage, right? So you could follow known energy usage patterns to interact with smart thermostats. If any of you have a Nest thermostat, um, you know, and you've allowed uh, the electric company to change your, uh, or the gas company to change your usage. They're using some kind of existing expert rules. Like we know that air conditioners all come on at 4 p.m. to cool down the house in the summertime. So they use that rule to then adjust your thermostat automatically. Mm -hmm. Or you could learn uh, things like what types of incentives and messaging lead to conservation of energy. You could predict how energy usage will change with the demand for electric cars. We actually had mm -hmm. one of our uh, master's students um, create a predictive model of just this sort as part of their capstone project last year. Um, or really on kind of the cutting edge of what's possible, perhaps you could generate a map of the best locations uh, for offshore wind power, right? Take uh, energy or retail and apparel. At the simplest level, you might just follow a routine that alerts users when a helmet is impacted, right? So you know the input, you know the output that you want, and you're just embedding that little bit of intelligence into a smart device. Uh, at the next level up, you could learn how different activities and usage patterns affect shoe longevity, right? So perhaps you've got statistics on all kinds of different you know, parts of the shoe and how they wear, you can feed that into a machine learning model to learn um, you know, how that affects the longevity of a given shoe. You could uh, predict right, from sensors uh, the level of exertion um, in your ski boots. Right? I've seen some apps coming out that are starting to do this sort of thing. Or at the uh, kind of cutting edge level, perhaps generate a staffing schedule for your retail establishment based on uh, a machine looking at video footage of customer traffic. So these are all areas that folks are actively working on you know, and need help with. So we've talked just a bit about the ways that AI can and, and will be used uh, in, in Oregon and elsewhere, but we also need to understand what that means for uh, the existing jobs that are out there uh, and also where we need to focus our education to make sure that um, we're in the right spot given 
this likely future. All right. So let's be honest, robots can just reach higher than humans. There are certain things that uh, machines just do better than we do. And to the extent uh, that we can, in a cost-effective way, develop machines that do these things, you're going to see more and more of it, whether it's self-driving or whether it's you know robotics and farming um, or whether it is, you know, uh, using generative AI to uh, replace customer service agents with a chatbot, right? These sorts of things are happening all over the place uh, and will continue uh, to happen over the foreseeable future. So what does that mean? It means that uh, the jobs kind of in the middle, the jobs that we uh, have been referring to as kind of knowledge worker jobs for the past uh, you know, 20 years or so are actually at risk in a way that they weren't before. And so when you think about something like provisioning or analysis, right, which are kind of you know, general characterizations of knowledge work, uh, it used to be that the machines weren't very good at that sort of thing. But with the rise of generative AI, uh, we now have a situation where a lot of that work can and will be done by machines in the future. So what are we left with? So if you think about the number of jobs that exist out in the world and the amount of training required or training or equivalent experience to be there, most of the jobs are in uh, labor or service. And then in the middle, you've got um, a lot of what I would consider knowledge worker jobs dealing with provisioning, basically coordinating and uh, scheduling and communicating, and then analysis, right? So taking uh, information in, providing some level of analysis, and then uh, spitting out some insights. Both of those activities are now being uh, challenged by sophisticated machines. And so, whereas before, you know, um, really it was labor and service jobs that were at highest risk, uh, more now than ever, uh, even, you know, kind of knowledge uh, workers uh, are at risk of being replaced by uh, intelligent machines. Now, it may be, and it has been in the past, that uh, there's just more jobs created elsewhere in the economy. And uh, I tend to believe that's the case as well. But the type and of these jobs is going to require some knowledge of how to use the machines and the algorithms that are doing the provisioning and analysis so that we can actually be more productive humans. What that means is that we have to up the level of training that we offer to uh, the general public to make sure that they sit on the right-hand side of the dividing line uh, between um, the work done by machines and the work that can be done uh, by humans. So let's talk a little bit about um, what that means in higher education, right? So essentially, we want to talk a little bit about educating the next generation of AI-aware, AI-ready uh, students uh, and workers, right? And so the question that we've been wrestling with at Willamette University for the last little bit is how do we design a suite of programs that prepares students for this AI-assisted futures? So that's essentially what we've done, uh, you know, with the creation of the School of Computing and Information Sciences here at Willamette University. And we are focused with a mission to train the next generation of tech, tech workers, right? We want not to just be the same old engineering school or, um, you know, uh, kind of the old uh, version of STEM education, but rather uh, a school focused on uh, the kind of work that is going to exist in the future. Uh, essentially, workers that are AI aware you know, technically competent for sure, but also acutely focused on the unique value that humans bring into the equation. So you might ask, well, 
what the heck does this mean in a practical sense? So this graphic represents uh, the scope of our school, and it expresses it in terms of subject matter and the degree pathways typical uh, for a subset of the content. So for instance, um, if you study computer science, uh, you tend to be a bit further uh, to uh, the left side of this Venn diagram. If you study statistics, uh, also a, a traditional kind of STEM discipline, you tend to be off to the right-hand side um, of this uh, Venn diagram. But where most of the magic happens and where most of the value that's going to be provided in the future occurs is in the middle here, where we're taking kind of our capacity to kind of automate the world that sits on the computer science side or analyze the world, which sits on the data science side, and take those two skills, automation and analysis, and put them to use uh, for humans, right? For something that, that humans want. And so we've got data governance, information architecture, ethics, uh, cybersecurity, human computer interaction, user experience design, right? All of these sorts of subject areas are laser focused on helping humans with technology, right? So to be certain, you need to know some computing and you need to know uh, some data science, right? Automation and analysis. But the purpose of our school is to give folks the tools necessary uh, to use automation and analysis towards some uh, kind of human uh, end, end, right? Some human-centered objective. And of course, we've been very intentional in building both the programs uh, that we offer uh, at the graduate level and undergraduate level, um, and uh, the faculty uh, that makes sure we, we address this uh, kind of human-centered nature of our technology future. For example, and this is where I get to brag about my awesome faculty for a little bit, right? Uh, Fred Agbo, um, in the computer science side of things, teaches human-computer interaction, game-based learning, virtual reality. He's actually worked with his students uh, to develop uh, some new virtual reality kind of learning games. Really, really, really cool research. Haiyan Cheng, she's focused on things like uh, machine learning on the one hand, but also algorithms and complexity. So very much the most efficient way of executing on some automation task. Calvin Deutschbein, they teach computer security, so cybersecurity, but also uh, uh, some of our ethics curriculum and specialize in things like computing systems. So clearly at the interface of humans and technology. Kristen Gore uh, comes to us from Hewlett Packard, managed to steal her away. She focuses on things like Six Sigma manufacturing, sampling strategy, research design, has always been focused on kind of the applied side of statistics and how uh, data science can help uh, companies uh, be better at the work they do. Uh, Heather uh, does survey statistics, political polling, data visualization, sitting right in the middle of the ways that humans uh, kind of understand and interact with data. Jed Rembold uh, focused on data engineering. If you don't know what that is and you uh, join our master's program, you will become intimately familiar with uh, relational databases, non-relational databases, uh, enterprise architecture, right? Designing data systems that serve human needs, uh, which is non-trivial, right? You could absolutely design data systems that serve the needs of a research project or you know, something else, but to design them in a way that's easy for humans to use is something special. Lucas, uh, teaching a um, mobile application development course uh, this semester that I'm really excited about, or I should say next semester. Lucas comes to us from kind of a software engineering uh, background. And um, if you think about what web development is or mobile app development, these topics really do sit right at the intersection of automation and human-computer interaction, right? You have to know 
how humans are going to use these mobile app applications uh, if you're going to design them well. Hank uh, comes to us from Berkeley and does all of the cool uh, stat stuff, focuses on probability, experimental design, advanced linear models. So very, very interesting um, kind of statistical learning models that you can apply to big data sets. And last but not least, our newest member of the team, Rachel Brown, uh, comes to us from NVIDIA Corporation, where she was a research scientist for a long time and also taught at Berkeley. And she specializes in computer vision, machine learning, parallel processing, and does some of the coolest research um, of anyone that I've had the pleasure of interacting with. Okay, so that is the cool faculty. And this is kind of where they sit back on um, you know, the uh, Venn diagram of work uh, that we do at the School of Computing and Information Sciences. Calvin's going to particularly like this, this diagram because they get to sit in the center. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have this covered and we are growing um, every year. We're hiring several more faculty this year. You know, the popularity of our programs, it keeps pushing us uh, to offer more and to offer more depth. And so uh, I'm excited to keep hiring and keep uh, filling in you know, all of, of the different areas uh, of this uh, diagram with, with talented faculty. All right, so what are the main takeaways uh, from this quick talk? Uh, number one, AI is transitioning from prediction um, to generation. So there's still a lot of work you know, in the prediction world. And a lot of the work that organizations are doing right now is just getting their data to a state, right? Their database systems to a state where they can actually apply uh, predictive models to that data. Uh, and then some of the organizations uh, at the Vanguard are starting to move into uh, generative models um, and how they uh, can use that to provide value for their, their customers. Second, AI is being adopted in literally every sector of, of Oregon's economy and really every sector in the world um, at different rates. And so this isn't just a tech company issue anymore. Uh, it's an every company issue. And um, these skills are going to be needed in in literally uh, every uh, job that matters in the future. And third, uh, we can use AI, right, these techniques to build the future, but we do have to focus on the right kind of training because the kinds of jobs uh, that higher education traditionally trained people for, you know, they're, they're going to be around for a bit longer, but many of those knowledge work jobs uh, can be done either more efficiently or entirely uh, by these machine learning systems. And so learning how to develop, uh, use, uh, and then put to use uh, these systems is uh, very important for training uh, the, the next uh, generation of uh, workers uh, for uh, Oregon and for the world. And of course, uh, the the proof uh, is uh, in the pudding, as they say. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to end with just a few of our recent alumni who are already out uh, in the world doing amazing things at companies like Adobe and Activision. Connor, he's landed his dream job at the San Diego Padres you know, and, and others working at Marriott, Echo Northwest, et cetera. These uh, are... Um, exceptional examples of the kind of training that, that we provide and the kind of student um, the world needs. And with that, Hillary, um, I am happy to take any questions that might exist. Sounds great. Thank you, Jameson. Uh, let me take a peek at the Q&A. I don't see any questions coming in. You uh, Attendees are welcome to put questions there. Um, we can't hear your voices because we're on the kind of the, the webinar uh, set up instead of a meeting set up, uh, but you're welcome to use the Q&A. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm available as well if you have questions about the application process or kind of the way that students flow through the program um, for both the computer science and data science programs. And we are available to assist. Thank you so much for that presentation, by the way, Jameson. It's, I know I'm, I'm, I'm in there with you. I'm, I'm part of the work, but I'm always inspired to learn about the latest and greatest.
Yeah, no problem. Excellent. All right. I don't see any questions coming through. I will. I, I know that the invitation promised some tips and tricks on the application. So I'll throw out just a, a couple of things if you guys are getting thoughts together. Uh, one is that our first deadline, don't be freaked out, is Friday. It's December 15th. Uh, we also have a deadline coming up January 15th. Uh, we do review applications outside of deadline, uh, but it's nice to ally yourself with, kind of align with one of those deadlines because it will help us schedule your interview, which is an important part of the application process. Uh, we don't need official transcripts when you apply. An unofficial transcript will get us what we need. Uh, we also don't need either application fees or test scores. So, you know, the application is designed to be pretty easy to get through. We would love to see a resume, a transcript, um, a statement, and two letters of reference. And, you know, I encourage you all to come in and, and join this work. We have some really, really interesting things happening uh, in these one-year evening programs. All right. I'm not seeing any uh, questions come through. So maybe we can wrap it up and let people have a fun Monday evening. Of Excellent. Course. All right. Well, thank you again, Jameson. It was, it's always great to see you. Um, I'll see you on, I guess you're not on campus tomorrow, but I'll see you this week, I'm sure. Participants, thank you so much for joining. And uh, yes, look forward to seeing your applications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.